Thirdly, the strengthening of the common forest, foreign and security policy, the CSFP. And in that respect, the treaty has improved the leadership at the top, uh, with the creation, of course, of the high representative. It also have, has given legal personality to the EU, so that the EU is clearly entitled to conclude international agreements. And we have clarified the procedure for concluding international agreements. Um, this is also a very important point. You know the Bhutan that the uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs used to uh, uh, use, Mark Eskens, who said, uh, Europe is uh, an economic giant, it's a political dwarf, and it's a military worm, he said. I don't know if, uh, uh, close the brackets, I don't take this uh, quotation for myself, but it did, at a time when we were nowhere, now we are somewhere, it did give a clear idea that wanting to have a strong presence in the world without any military capability is a very difficult thing to do. And the fourth element is uh, the common security and defense policy. Uh, some significant improvements were made in this area. I just mentioned, uh, for, for brevity, I, I just mentioned the creation of the possibility for a limited number of member states to undertake CSDP missions and to engage in permanent structured cooperation. Uh, the drafting also of the new mutual assistance and solidarity clause or also the creation of a European Defense Agency. All efforts that have to give a response to the quotation of Mark Eskins that I just mentioned. And finally, the fifth uh, new tool, uh, perhaps a word on, on some important innovations in other areas of external affairs, especially trade policy matters. Important innovations are the inclusion of services and foreign direct investment as a new exclusive competence of the Union and the enhancement of the position of the European Parliament in the conclusion of international trade agreements must, must now give its consent when the area covered by the agreement touches on matters which are internally in the EU decided uh, with the co-decision. So you see that important steps, also thanks to the Lisbon Treaty, have been taken to strengthen Europe's world, role in the world. But it is not enough. The world is not waiting for us, and the pace of change and events is sometimes stunning. The EU is still perceived by its partners as not living up to its potential. As our difficult internal discussions on how to react with unity, uh, for example, in, uh, in the Middle East, the peace process, or in other issues of big importance for the world, we see that Europe continues to struggle to find an adequate role in events that, in, that unfold at its back doors. Looking back, back at almost two years of participation in the Foreign Affairs Council of the EU, I see the following areas for improvement or further development. And this will conclude my, my, uh, my uh, uh, lecture, giving you five ideas on how to be more effective. I think we should develop further and explain better the unique policy mix which the EU as a sui generis world actor can offer both in solving conflicts and in developing bilateral relations with third countries, for example with association agreements. No other international organization, if we can call the EU an international organization, no other international organization can provide similar comprehensive action in the form of civil, military operation, development cooperation, people-to-people -people activities and trade. So the comprehensive capacity of the European Union of being able to manage the relations with others on different levels is tremendous and uncomparable. Did you know, for example, that when it comes to development budgets, Half of the world's development budget is paid by European member states or by the European Union. So we're a very strong partner in development aid. Choosing to make this part of a larger view when it comes to the relationship with other countries must be a tool that uh, gives more result than uh, organizing, let's say, pillars of the different policies. That is also one of the choices that the Lisbon Treaty has made. It was not only about creating more coherence within the 27 member states. 
it was also about creating more coherence between the policies that the European Union develops, be it in trade, be it in foreign affairs, be it in development, be it in military. The European answer to the Arab awakening was the perfect occasion to renew and rethink Europe's approach on neighborhood policy. And for the first time, it is clearly stated that the more a partner country can do in terms of reform, be it economical, social or political, the more engagingly the EU will be able to come forward. And we call this principle more for more and also less for less. Those who do not play the game, they will get less. Those who play the game will get more. That's the first advice I have to give. Second uh, idea, we need to improve our main new diplomatic tool, the European External Action Service. In March of uh, this year, the Benelux countries wrote a quite well-received paper on how day-to-day -day cooperation between the European diplomacy and the member states should be improved. Among other things, we propose to increase and stimulate the shared analysis of events because it leads, of course, to more common conclusions and actions. And eventually, this will help the EU and its member states to speak with one voice, or at least to convey the same messages. Together with the Baltic states, the Benelux countries agreed to examine how EEAS, the External Action Service, could develop action in the consular field. The creation of uh, the European External Action Service with more than 130 delegations abroad combined with the legal basis in the treaties on European citizenship, offers a real chance to improve the consular service we can give to European citizens, traveling or residing in third countries. Especially in situations of disaster relief or coordination in case of natural disasters, much more cooperation could and should be possible. We worked very hard on that during our Belgian presidency uh, of the European Union, because we had the experience of Haiti, where a lot of effort was done, a lot of result was obtained, but where we saw a lot of room for improvement as far as efficiency goes, if we would have coordinated even better. We also have to learn urgently to do more with the existing resources that are duplicated 27 full times. Our 27 EU foreign ministries employ 94,000 people in 2010 an army of 94,000 staff members in 2010 spread over 3,150 embassies or missions or consulates worldwide. It is clear that there Europe can do better by joining forces. It is becoming more and more difficult to explain to our public opinion why a smart and rational cooperation between our member state diplomatic <coughs> services is not advancing more. A third idea I want to suggest is let's pay special attention to a more ambitious European representation in international institutions. I told you already how quickly and profoundly the emerging economies are overtaking the traditional global economic powers. This will be felt very soon in the fora where the principal lines of economic policies are developed. <coughs> developed. The same is true for the UN or for uh, OSCE in Vienna and we should give more attention to the question on how the EU, or when appropriate, the Eurozone, can be best represented at these tables. A fourth idea I want to mention is that we need to provide enough financial means for our common external policies in the European budget. Talking about the European budget is a very hard thing to do. There is a lot of populism uh, that is being told in the European uh, public opinions about countries having to restrain their expenditure and of course adding to that if each and every country has to have a good look at its expenditure why should the European Union not have to do the same? Why should they have increased budgets at a time when the 27 member states have to uh, scale down? That of course is a paradox. A paradox in the sense that there is absolutely no contradiction in having more money for the European Union while having less money for the member states of the European Union or at least less money for the public expenditure of these uh, member states. Ask yourself if peace in the Middle East is best helped if 27 ministers of foreign affairs go to see Abbas and go to see Netanyahu or if it's better served when uh, Catherine Ashton goes there 
with the voice of the European Union united. And tell yourself that having 27 trips of 27 ministers cost probably 27 times as much as the trip of Catherine Ashton. So I think we need to be very lucid about this. It is also about making it possible for member states to be more efficient about their expenditures while giving more room for uh, European budget. The negotiation of the next multi-annual financial framework, the so-called MFF, for the period 2014-2020 in the European Union has started some months ago. You know that the European Union has a logic of having a seven-year period of multi-annual uh, uh, budgetary uh, uh, provisions. And in the current seven-year period, which is the, the period between 2007 until 2013, not more than 6.2% of the EU budget, approximately 58 billion euros, are spent on the external action of the EU. 58 billion euros. One might think that uh, this is a lot of money, but I think that in the same time that if you compare it to the, the army of which I, I spoke uh, uh, a few minutes ago, 94,000 people in the different member states, it is clear that there is uh, room for, uh, for more capacity. The Commission has proposed to raise this amount for the next period from 58 billion to 70 billion euros while providing some other resources for unforeseen events outside, uh, outside the framework. And it's now up to the Member States and the European Mar Parliament to agree on the structure and the amounts of the next MFF. It is clear, you already heard it now by the way in which I speak, that Belgium will do all it can to preserve the already limited budget for external action. And we hope to find a strong ally in the European Parliament. And last idea I want to share with you is uh, the further development of a more coherent, efficient and credible security and defense architecture for the EU. I said earlier how the Treaty of Lisbon created several new possibilities for improved action in this area, but has to be applied. Last year during our EU presidency, the 27 ministers of defense met at an informal meeting in Ghent and launched a policy debate on the concept of pooling and sharing, which means developing together new military capabilities in order to increase interoperability and save money. Several member states have begun to apply this principle among them. For example, the naval forces of Belgium and the Netherlands have developed a very close cooperation. We also have developed a common training structure for our jet fighter pilots with France. And the United Kingdom and France concluded last year a far-reaching defense cooperation agreement, and so on. What is lacking, though, is a Europe-wide pattern of cooperation, and also the development of a common and a permanent capability to prepare and conduct military operations. This is the nowadays much discussed this question of the creation of a permanent operational headquarter in Brussels. It might not be in Brussels if that could help. Uh, the, the situation. It's a unique headquarter that interests me. Brussels is already is always ready to uh, to host uh, anything that needs hosting, but it's not about Brussels. It's about Europe. Belgium is very much in favor of such a structure, mainly for practical efficiency and cost-effective reasons. <laughs>